Ed and Phil Baker. And, uh, yeah, yeah well, these are our names. <laughs> Which is, uh, it's not alphabetical. There doesn't seem to be any rhyme or reason to how they put these in here. But that's neither here nor there. This is about from Fan to Filmmaker. We can probably start by just introducing ourselves. That wouldn't seem hard. Okay. Yeah, see, this, 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 this. <laughs> uh, Clancy, uh, my name is Clancy Bundy. I'm from Spokane, and uh, I work on Translator Galactica, which is a sci fi comedy show. My name is Christian Doyle. I am from uh, Tacoma, Washington. Sorry. I'm on walks on the beach. And I'm an actor uh, for some of the Entertainment and Dead Gentleman Productions as a uh, guy who wears a dress. <laughs> <laughs> and you wear that dress very well. Thank you. <laughs> uh, way to creep me out, guy. <laughs> uh, I am Adam Harum. Uh, I write and direct uh, and act for Transport Galactica, and I do a lot of visual effects and editing uh, for everybody. Pretty much everybody watches watch this thing. <laughs>
episode five, we met up with the zombie Orpheus guys, and it was like, okay, let's let's do ten episodes and then reflect and look at what we've done and see what have we done, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, make a plan for future action. And, and I think too, it, it helped that the fan base kind of was growing. We weren't getting the same four people who were sending us messages saying, oh, I love it, make the next episode. It was weird because hearing from new people with every episode and seeing more YouTube comments and stuff, you're like, oh wow, this is really catching on. And it is an interesting thing too because um, we're obviously a parody show, so we're making fun of everything that people love. And some people like that we're doing that, and some people don't. But it's kind of, it, it's an audience base that's already there, and someone, people are looking, you know, those fans are looking for the kind of thing that we do. And a lot of the, re the, the reason people really seem to enjoy our show is that there's not a lot of sci-fi comedy or sci-fi parody, so we're, we're literally a bit of a unique, like, niche. You know, not a lot of people have that. So when the, that audience base, which is already established and already out there, finds it, then, they're, then it grows and it can get um, It's kind of how Zombie Opie's took off, right? You guys down that, that man base. Yeah, but it's a it's a really interesting distinction because uh, Glitch is still finding its feet in terms of clarifying its audience, and I think one of the reasons why is because it is not that quickly recognizable. You know, uh, in case you guys don't know, Glitch is a super awesome uh, web series. Watch Glitch. Yes. Um, but it is a basically a sitcom about a game tester who wishes his life was more like a video game and of course the wish comes true and it's very, very inconvenient. Uh, and we had a lot of fun making it. I think it's a very good show and it turns out that we have lots of phantom fans. Uh, everyone, when you pin them down, will admit that they will like it, but no one is sharing it. Uh, like, super big nerdy icons like Chris Hardwick are apparently fans who just haven't bothered to <laughs> um, and I think one of the reasons why is because it doesn't have a one sentence log line and it doesn't look like something really familiar like Transsolar does. Yeah. It's like within three frames you're like, oh I get what they're doing. It's, it's original and really clever, but it is also really instantaneously familiar looking just because of the, uh, the West Wing. <laughs> I was gonna say just you know your Starship Bridge yeah, setting, yeah, like yeah, you yeah. know that just looks familiar, yeah. even if it's not identical to anything. Um, and and of course, no one's really figured out how to capitalize an online audience exactly. You know, uh, most of the zombie <laughs> Orpheus, <laughs> most of the zombie Orpheus groundwork was laid uh, before they had fan base website. You know, a lot of it was more old fashioned word of mouth than social networking in the last couple of years. Most of who they are distributing and selling and marketing to are the fans that they had were built ten years ago through stuff like Dorkness. And so they are building an audience but to a degree with production they're preaching to a established choir as opposed to trying to find a fan base from scratch like you guys were able to and my trajectory with Glitch was very much in keeping with the name of this panel. I met the creator, Tyler Hill, because I was editing a novel of his. And uh, I had just finished the Kickstarter campaign with Journey Quest II, and they were about to launch their Kickstarter campaign for Glitch, so I was able to give them a lot of information that they didn't have already. I helped them edit their Kickstarter campaign and get it sorted out. And uh, then I was so excited about the property that I just kind of never left. Uh, I was a production assistant from day one, and by the end of shooting of the first season, I was an actual producer because I'd done so much work, and that was nothing but a labor of love. I just came on and heard about what they were doing, and I just met the guys putting it together already, and the more they talked about it, the more I heard about what they were doing, and the more I met the actors involved and understood what they were doing, I just kept Never leaving. Uh, I That's guess, not how it usually works. No, really. <laughs> you don't usually like get hired on as a production assistant. Then by the end of the shoot, you're a producer because you worked really hard. <laughs> <laughs> he makes that sound really good. That's, that's not a real thing. Well, when you're the only person who is consistently helpful for three months, uh, so let's that helps. It. Let's flip this around. Let's say you guys have a project that you know you are a fan of something.
guess who your audience is. Yes. I mean, I think that's really important and, and why why your concept and your idea is going to appeal to that audience, why the concept should come to light. Why it's going to be different. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that's true, especially in the, in the web world, that people are seeing a lot of material come out uh, come out of it now. So you really have to kind of come up with something that, that is novel and unique and is a unique voice um, that is going to kind of stand out. Um, so that was something you guys did really well, and there's a really easy example to look at the success of the gamers and uh, Journey Quest and see that a lot of people have gone from fan to filmmaker expressly doing something else in that, I don't know, subgenre of fantasy comedy or parody comedy or parody fantasy rather or something and it's... <laughs> well, and it's reached a saturation point, and that's why it's important to know your audience. Is to a degree that audience is familiar with that and is looking for the next thing, not another version of the same thing. Right. That's one of the reasons why you guys are you guys is you got there first with your niche, and um, and, and we're aware of those. I mean, that's with our second season, we're making a lot of modifications to the devices we've used and stuff because it's the same thing. There is that saturation point. We want to keep things fresh and. So at some point you also do have to kind of let the show grow with the audience as well, so that you don't you don't lose people or, or become stale. That you're not two and a half men. Do you worry? That, <laughs> do you worry that in growing the show and doing something new with it that you're alienating some of your previous? Yeah, that's always sort of the trade. That's, it's certainly a risk. Way. Yeah, it really is, and it's kind of you got to walk the fence on that one. Uh, we really feel that uh, with all the changes to the devices and what we're doing, the second season, just the, the translator universe and the comedy that everybody loved in the first season. Say device, you don't yeah. mean the props, you mean storytelling? I mean, I mean the storytelling, I mean, in the first season, at the end of every episode, if you guys aren't familiar, you can watch it. Uh, we, one or all of us we, die. We or all of us die or maim horribly at the end of our episode, and we come back in the next episode like a Tom and Jerry sketch or, or Kenny from South Park. Uh, but we understood that after about 10 seasons, that was kind of getting old. It's like, oh, well, now it's just every episode. It's like, how are they, they going to die this time? Well, so. yeah, our, our goal is to, to vary up the structure, and hopefully, the, by the stuff we're adding, is greater than the stuff that we're subtracting to it. Yeah. So the, I think the continuity and the, and the overarching story and the, all, all that will be the, the goodness, hopefully, of that. Our fans will appreciate more than losing those kind of uh, superficial uh, structure devices that we Plus, he sort of got absorbed into the actual story world. I mean, it started as sort of um, cherry picking these funny devices yeah, yeah. out of other sci fi series and saying, oh, this is why people get this. They'll laugh about this. I'm sure they've had these thoughts too. Uh, but then we started, the, the characters started growing and developing. It's kind of like, well, we need to, Transwood needs to exist in its own universe, and, and even if we pulled all those little jokes and gags out, it still needs to kind of be its own sci-fi show that sci-fi fans can appreciate. And that was interesting. We, 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 and we went from just being a straight parody of those little cliches and tropes to suddenly having a whole universe that existed. And now this character has a backstory. Yeah. That's interesting. It was fun. I mean, that, now it's, that was, again, what was great is there was this demand from fans of people enjoying their stuff and then just in, enjoying the process and it, it, and it went from being a big fan of these other shows to like hopefully it's something to repeat with those kind of shows. In terms of the actual crunchy advice for someone wanting to be on this side of the table, um, two things that I can think of that are really important. <clears throat> well, one is just true for filmmaking in general, which is... Um, you're only as good as the people that you work with. And the better a crew that you surround yourself with, the better you're going to look. Um, Orson Welles is very famous for making one of the greatest motion pictures of all time, and if you go back and do some homework on it, it's because he went and found everyone who was already amazing to work with him. Uh, the guy who shot it, the director of photography, who invented about five things that filmmakers still use at the time, um, was already regarded as a genius, so he was smart enough to hire the people um, but in terms of actual fan filmmaking, uh, the first big thing that I would say is don't ever expect to make any money. <laughs> um, I know... I'm sorry? Why would you? Because <laughs> uh, you're going to spend a lot of time doing it. <laughs> <laughs> it'll be nice it'll seem like it. a job. <laughs> I know. It, 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 it will be work, <laughs> and occasionally it feels like you should get paid for working really hard. But you should yeah. tell you why, and it's a good reason, usually. <laughs> <laughs> I met the guy in Seattle, Leo Roberts, who was the creative force behind one of the first really big fan film projects, uh, Star Trek and Phoenix, and uh, <clears throat> years and years ago. Um, and 
they were one of the groups that helped establish legal limits for the use of the Creative Commons license to be able to use someone else's property to make an actual fan film in, you know, the fan film equivalent of fan fiction. They made a film project that took place in the Star Trek universe and didn't get sued for it. And they didn't get sued for it because they're allowed to do whatever they want as long as they don't make any money. <laughs> and they worked really hard. Um, and then the other factor, I think, uh, especially in the last couple of years, um, Kickstarter is very, very quickly going to cease being the giving career. Um, a lot of people, which included, um, were able to get in on it when it was new and shiny um, and get enough money to make a first season. It's going to get a lot harder a lot quicker because the people who are really good at running Kickstarters are really good at it and more and more professionals like Veronica Mars' crew are turning to it for much bigger projects and there's only so much fan money floating around. And odds are they're going to want to give that money to Veronica Mars instead of something they've never heard of, even if it involves someone that I would say, too, I mean, it seems very simple and basic, but if you go out and do it, I mean, there's something you can definitely, you know, you might have reservations about taking a stab at it, but that part of the positive sense of the internet world is that you can get that instant feedback, whether it's good or bad. Uh, I think that can help you grow as a, as a filmmaker and an artist, and then, like, you fine-tune and hone in on, on what you're trying to do. So, I mean, just, just go out and do it. Did, did you know, you guys go to school? Yeah. <laughs> I think that's kind of how we do it. You're talking about a group, finding a group of people that yeah. you work well with. Uh, all of us that work on Trade Soul, we all went through school together, um, or at least in the same school we ran through, but we all worked in the film industry, different jobs, and it was a matter of, you, it's all about contacts and who you know and who you're meeting with, and it was, we eventually all gravitated towards each other and realized, like, we're working well, we work cohesively, we work well together, and we can yell at each other, and the next day still work together, and that kind of thing. So it's, it's a bad point. Like, two days. Right, two days. <laughs>
right now is if you're in charge of a project and you're creating and directing and producing and whatever, you're never going to have the time to publicize it as well. Uh, so find a friend who is dedicated, uh, who wants to be your net guru, and not even try to draw people, but establish a Facebook and establish a Twitter and be regular on there. And have someone whose job it is to interact with the fans or to uh, mock the trolls or delete their comments, you know, because all of that is useful and all of that builds momentum, but once you're focused on actually creating a project, you're never going to have time to do I, uh, I do theater, and it's the same thing as well. By the time we've reached the stage that's really important to start publicizing, it has to be someone else's job because I'm just focused on getting it done. I think Bo hit it too with that dedicated audience, even if it's smaller, especially when you're first starting. Those, those people are your saviors. They're the ones who are going to be out there. You don't have to go and plug your stuff on the internet. They're the ones doing it for you. And that says something about your project. It really helps they grow in that way as well. When we were seeing trans blue shirts at Radcon, like, we didn't go to Radcon. We missed out. And we pledged our sending us photos of like, people who weren't trans blue shirts. Like, crap, that's so awesome. Like, we aren't even there. We, we, Oh, and having a dedicated web person, even if all they do is run your Facebook and Twitter, will also help you not miss if someone says, hey, you should come to our thing, because unless you have a website and a physical mailing address and what have you, that's the only way a con or someone else is going to be able to reach you, and you don't want to lose that through a spam filter. Uh, I was wondering how you guys overcame a few things. Um, I was in we film just school. <laughs> I was in film school, and I had to film film projects for classwork. My artist, too, a couple of other things was finding time to film and finding actors that you could bribe with things out of the money. <laughs> I was kind of wondering how you got when you knew you weren't going to make any money. How you convinced actors to come to your project? Uh, Chris, going to going to a bigger market helps. Because uh, coming from Seattle, there is, I mean, they might not all be good, but there's no shortage of actors who work for free. That's so true. Um, well, that actors, we're, we're vain. Like, we want to be on yeah, camera. Yeah, we want to be on camera. So I got to come back to college, too. We want to be on camera. You know, you got to give us something. And, well, or the, the well, flip side is, is yeah, what I a did. project where it's just starring the people who <laughs> yeah. 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 I, mean, I, I, six, I had two days to film what we were taking. When I auditioned for Darkness Rising, um, there was no there was no pay for that at all. But what they did do was they wrote up this great big, really fancy looking contract that said that you know if the movie made money, I would get some money from that. Yeah. I mean, I have it hasn't happened. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. They had expectations. It hadn't happened, and they still expected something. Like, yes. Is it going to happen soon? I'm like, is it going to Here's, here's the thing, though. I, I didn't get paid for that, and I've done, what, four more things? Four, five, six, a million more things for the same people, because they put me in movies. Well, and I think that's important, too. Uh, there is that hurdle of trying to convince people, which can be difficult. I think, you know, we, at least at our stage now, we try and just feed people. <laughs> I mean, that's a big one, and just like, at the very least, we'll feed you lunch. Um, and, and Bo's right, I mean, Transiller kind of started with just the, the main crew was also the actors, uh, which helped us because then at that point when the show started getting a little bit more traction and popularity, people actually wanted to be a part of the show. They liked what they were doing. Yeah, there's a catch-22 of it because yeah. just about anything that Zoe does at this point, you can say, hey, we want actors, and people will kill each other to get in the right because it's established. Right. So you just have to get over the first hurdle to get the first thing done so that you can point it and say, like, this right. is what I did, this many people watched it and then the actors will and you give then copies they will so I'm sorry. Do you give copies to the actors? So well, we sell the copies to the actors. <laughs> 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 what a great plan! I like that. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, and we try and give other perks too. I mean, we did uh, an origin episode shoot where we were like in the middle of the night in the cold. We needed like 30 people to come dressed up like they were at some, you know, hot planet space bar. And we, we convinced a bunch of people to do it, but we had food and then we did like raffles where we gave away a bunch of our merch that people were excited about too. And, and then when they're there on set, take care of them. I mean, they are being there for free.
breathe. A lot of people are helping you, like, don't burn any bridges. Right. Especially it's a lot of prep, like, yeah. pre production, because you don't if want they, If they walk away and they didn't get paid, too. but they had a sandwich oh, and they had a good time, they're going to come back. Um, that's a really good point. Like, you mentioned prep and the pre production. If they're, if they're, if they're, uh, a lot of people are sitting around, sitting around, then they're going to leave. And they're so, gonna leave. Yeah. based yeah. on what you said, the context you gave us before you asked the question, um, the important thing with finding actors and creating that kind of environment is not to find yourself in the position where you have two days to shoot six weeks into. Yeah. Uh, you have to start three months out so that you never wind up in that position. I did, but I didn't find my actors until two days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have the time to meet a lot more actors than yeah. the ones who just want to well, this, is, this is a student film project, right? It's a student film project. Don't, don't, don't sweat about it. But, it's, but I have other like, ideas, and I want to expand on the pro student project and make it a, make it a bigger film. Oh, sure. But I can't I can't get any actors to work when since I have to work a job that gets paid, so I only got so many times to film. So I just just get your, just get your friends to start with. Just get people who you know that you you have accountable on like a personal friendship level. Yeah. And it'd be if they can't really act. I mean, just just get that first one out of the gate, you know, and then it'll, you'll help you as a director looking at trying to get them to act. You know, what yeah, you that's, do that. that's the problem I have. Uh, the young lady in the tripod shirt has you. Kind of question. Okay. Um, so, what, so for beginner film, fa fan, filmmakers, what would you say would be a good time frame? Because I've seen people do, like, full-blown one-hour movies. <laughs> I did that growing up, actually. My first, like, feature was, like, an hour-and-a-half long Indiana Jones fan film. <laughs> and that's very, in a way, for <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 
um, to learn what you're really good at and what you're really going to need to find other people to work with who are better at than you are. Uh, I'm really, really good at act with actors. I'm, I can't do a damn thing with a camera. And it's <laughs> way too late for me to learn. <laughs> I, wonder, I question how you guys do, uh, how you work together as a team well. Because a lot of projects, it's like there's one person that comes up with an idea, and then they are twisting arms. And that's got to be Trent Solar and the Journey Quest. There's so many, so many artists involved. Yeah. That how is it you're not slapping each other? Constantly? We, well, I mean, on our end of it anyway, we we go into it knowing that we've got to get a particular thing done, and we, we're all a team. The crew and the actors work together. You see. Like, ours is one of the only sets you're going to see an actor carrying, like, yeah. Oh, God, yeah. <laughs> every, every, like, don't tell anyone in a union, but, I mean, yeah, but yeah, everyone everybody does, does a little Everybody bit. does everything. Everybody's working behind the scenes. Everybody, you know, gets wet together and, you know, gets cold together and dies outside together. <laughs> uh, eventually, with your group, when you establish your group, uh, which I encourage, you're going to fall into roles. So, yeah. on the Trans Solar set, you know, when it comes to the question of how things look or what should this area look like, that, that kind of, Adam and I talked about that first. And then we bring Adam Wood along, he says, that's, it. we can't freaking do that, guys. Dial it down, then we go back to the drawing board a little bit, and then, you know, you kind of establish your role. So I would never say, hey, Jay, you need to shoot it from this angle, because that's like a breach of contract and friendship trust. And, and, I, 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 think it, trust. I think it worked out, too, because we all of these kind of screens on a, on a professional level working on larger films. And so we can see what, what worked and what doesn't on that scale and how that translates to what we're doing. I mean, to say, oh, uh, actors are carrying lights, but to some extent, for that project, that brings a lot more to something like Journey Quest, where the crew is that cohesive and everybody's putting in that effort. So it's sort of the same thing on that end, where we could say, well, you know, if we were on a bigger movie, I wouldn't be touching this, but that's not what we're on. We're on Translate Black that we we're a group, and it's, it's, it's ownership for all of us. So there were some things that we, you know, figured out as a, in, a, in a producer role. I do, but there's other things where Adam and Crancy are the creative guys, and when they come up with a script or an idea, I go for it. Okay, so we should get that. Um, some of it rose out of what I was talking about. Was starting with something smaller, is figuring out those dynamics and figuring out at the end of the day whose feet you lay the blame at, um, <laughs> if nothing else, you know, in. In Seattle, like I said, because there's the a bit more of the old tour perspective, like on most sets at the end of the day, someone you can point a finger at and say, like, that dude is in charge. Um, on the glitch set, um, that guy. <laughs> on, the, on the glitch set, I was, by the time we were done, I was second in command. Um, if you had a question, if you were on set, if you were an actor, if you were behind the scenes, what have you and you had a question, you came to me so that you didn't bug the director, because he was busy. Um, and... But he wasn't. <laughs> uh, there's usually... Once you get to the gray area that definitely Zombie Orpheus operates in, where everyone is under a contract, you usually have a really strongly established chain of command, which says, like, if you have a question about this, you go to this person. And uh, I did a short film in college, and we were all friends, and during a particularly challenging shoot, my buddy turned to the actress and he said, like, right now, I need you to shut up, because I am not your friend today, I am your director, and do what you are told. And uh, she did it, and then she didn't talk to him for a month. <laughs> um, and so he and I established that if we ever made a film together as grown-ups, that he would handle everything technical and I would handle um, and not just because I'm a little bit better at it, but because he didn't have the bandwidth to do everything all at once. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is less about titles than about finding what everyone's really best at. You know, and when you have a team like you guys, like you said, the, the camera's Jade Perk, like you're not going to tell him how to shoot something. Uh, I would assume that's at least Pavi because you guys learn by default eventually who's the best person to leave those decisions. Like our, Isaac is our, is our our best writer in a way because he's our bullshit reader. <laughs> we'll we'll write stuff and then we'll, we'll give it to him.
and sometimes even on set, like, no, this line is this line is dumb and it doesn't work, and then he'll give you like a litmus reason like why it is, and then mm. he'll fix it. And sometimes he's just making that up so he doesn't have to memorize all those lines. <laughs> <laughs> Usually he has some very uh, yeah, very valid points, and uh, like, his knowledge of, of the genre, of, like the stuff making fun of, is so deep. Like he's probably the nerdiest out of all of us. So like, we are happy to respect whatever he has to say at some level. <laughs> and and what, he's within the group, but in that respect, he works as that external mm. sounding board, so that we aren't all just in love with our own. It's God, they're so funny. And, uh, <laughs> in the Two Bads podcast yesterday, Andy told me that they were talking about getting sad, and Andy said the most important thing you can do, step one, is to find someone who will tell you that you're not good. Yeah. Um, and not to, like, beat you down, but to find someone who will be like, no, you can do better than that. Yeah. Or here's uh, why it's not Exactly. Yeah. You, and that's even better. Yeah, yeah, to have someone who says, not only this isn't working, but I can tell you exactly why, and that helps you fix it. Uh, we will hear the new. That was really okay. <laughs> My main question is, um, we know that Hollywood is really vain, is, and <laughs> in that um, there's something called Hollywood Ugly, where it's just lots of, if that either makeup is involved, or them just average looking, not like supermodel, like, because some actors are like that. Some shows are like that. So how is that different from fan uh, fan stuff? Like, for example, I am not a skinny mini, and since I only have a group of me and my friend here, I'm like, okay, ha this is not going to go well because I am not skinny or all that nice to look at. Uh, 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 compared to most actors. I think I think especially with fan films, it matters a lot less of how you look. So you said Hollywood is really vain. That's that's yeah, but uh fan in our universe, our culture, everything here is is it's not. It's more about what you're making, what you love, what you're doing. So definitely focus on that. Don't worry about the other guys. It's more on this scale it's more important to be relatable. Um, yeah. than it is it's to be pretty. Very true. Yeah. And that requires a certain amount of looks. And we still have to acknowledge that the pretty Look, people... We don't, re Scott, we, we right? don't relate to the really ugly dude every <laughs> single time. We don't. We make him the plucky sidekick. <laughs> hey, ugly dude, you are a really good actor. You know what I'd like you to do? I'd like you to say funny things when the hero says stuff. <laughs> You're the fluffy science geek. Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> I'm not good looking? <laughs>
he had never seen The Godfather, so I was no. like, okay, first, <laughs> <laughs> first watch, 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 spend watch a year movies, watching yeah. the kind of stuff you want to make, mm -hmm. and you will learn stuff by default. I had a conversation with someone who told me the basics of editing, and then the next five movies I watched, I was like, oh, wow, that's just really simple. That's mm -hmm. how they do it. This is how you guide the eye. Um, find filmmakers who are highly regarded technically and watch what they do. Uh, find filmmakers who are well known for getting really good work out of actors and try to figure out how. And then find movies that suck terribly. They're like watch, watch movie bull movies and then figure out what doesn't yeah, work. Yeah. Yeah. That works great with Kirby. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Uh, but yeah, step one for me is is um, I've spoken to so many people who wasted so much time going to school for acting when I think you should just go out and do it until you figure out what you're doing. No offense, acting is.
went to college for writing, and like these guys, it worked for me because um, I met people, and I took a class on biography writing, and I worked on the newspaper, so I did writing that I wouldn't have done otherwise. But I will tell you that four years of college did not make me a better writer. Uh, memorize Strunk and White, uh, the elements yeah. of style. Go pick up Stephen King's book on writing and learn yeah. what he has to say. And remember, the most important thing I ever say when I teach creative writing is that if something works for you, keep doing it. You go to writing lessons, you go to writing classes, everyone will tell you this is the way that I do it and therefore it's the way that you should do it, which is crap. If something works, keep doing it. Don't wreck your system or what works for you or what is productive for you because someone tells you that it didn't work for them. Um, I like going to college. I like studying writing. I'm not a better writer because I went to college. And it didn't help me break in because I still haven't. I think there's also a lot of educational resources and books and things that you can find. I mean, if you're actually looking at breaking the screen writing, there's a ton of, they're the same textbooks your professor will make you read in the class, but you can read them on your own. Uh, same thing. Yeah. Look at movies that are regarded as really well written and pick apart those elements. Yeah. And watch movies that are really well made but really crappily written and figure out why. You know, the Hollywood writing movies by committee thing, you can look at stuff like Green Lantern and be like, this is lousy because no one was in charge. No one had a creative writers on the project. And, yeah, and, and <laughs> 12 people contributed to the script for it. I've often heard that you should watch it. That's uh, a I good would, movie. Yeah, I was going to say, I would say Edward's movies would be a better example of someone who wanted to be awesome and never was. Like, the, the movie is educational and it's well written and well made, but. Uh, well, like, even his movies, it's like yes. studying what he did wrong. Because mm -hmm. yeah, he did everything wrong. <laughs> There's actually a uh, story by Robert he, he, he He's one of those guys that has all those seminars in LA. Mm -hmm. you know? And he, he has a lot of uh, really interesting insight about the classical structure. Of, of screenwriting, and so you can use that as your foundation and then throw away uh, most of it later if you want. Because um, there, there's that core. I mean, if you're looking to break into like the mainstream writing style or technique, yeah. you're going to want to pick up that book because they're rigid. Like, they're stuck rigid. on that format, you know what I mean? It's, it's called, called Story. story. It's, it's called Story by Robert. And, 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 I mean, it tackles, you know, good character arc and the four act structure of screenplays and. Yeah. and Right. That same that movies and that you notice is it's because of that the ball structure that's being and it's sort of developed over here. You know, you learn the rules and then you can break them. Exactly. Yeah. You, you don't yeah. necessarily want to make it uh, cookie cutter classes. Consider that right? it's like jazz. The guys who are really good at improvising are really, really educated. They had to bust their ass to get to a certain point of skill before they could just start winging it. Um, you look at people who traditionally have broken rules, like Quentin Tarantino. He never went to film school, but he absorbed as much film as he could. And he, I'm sure, read that book and learned those rules and figured that out and then said, okay, I've got a good enough grasp of it that I know how to do it differently and still succeed. Mm -hmm. Next question. Awkward silence. Quick interjection. <laughs> yeah, well, we're talking about Scott's around, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a book by Tim Moshansky called A to Z Film Guide to Film Terms. Mm. Oh. Um, oh. And that there's two years be, of film school. Yeah. Back. Serious. <laughs> no joke. Yeah. And, and that my will, first day on set, I thought I knew stuff, and half the words they used, I was like, I don't know, and I'm too scared. Now. I was trying to find Video Village on a map. Yeah. I've never heard of Video Village, Washington. <laughs> 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 Writer's uh, Digest book. What does strike now, mean? Hold on, now, now tell people what Video Village is. What does strike you mean? You've been in the theater. It depends on if you're in the WGA. Take it down. Striking the sound? Striking the sound? Right, but Frank, you can be striking. turning on a light. Yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so there's a lot of terms that are in theater that aren't the same yeah. on a okay. film well, set that you're yeah. like, Strike, we just set up. Why am I like, oh, hopefully it's like my Video Village. Okay, yeah. so yes. there's all sorts uh, of... Video Village is just the area that you would normally set up monitors uh, connected to the camera where some directors, directors or producers mm -hmm. will sit. And Usually it's a tent with a pile yeah. of TVs. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And everyone just sits My favorite one was the Apple box where it's like, yeah, yeah, actually even drove and got like the juice box. <laughs> 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 I've heard those and things. And Apple boxes. I don't think those are real. I don't know what he talks about, but I've never heard anyone else. Yeah. Yeah. 
if someone says Abby's up and you're like, what? Yeah, what? She's not even on the call sheet. Thank you for the dog. The key. Martini shot's real though. Yeah. The dog got the keys. Uh, what is the most important lesson you have learned as a filmmaker? We start on that in the tape. <laughs> <laughs> the most important lesson uh, is just to keep your ears open. You're never going to be done learning on a movie set. Uh, and you're never going to be done learning with your friends. Uh, the second you, uh, you stop listening or stop paying attention is the second you're going to phone a lot of stuff at once. So that's the most important. Just be alert and uh, always be willing and able to learn. See, that's... One of those things that's a lot easier to learn on a uh, cheap or simple project than when there's a lot of other people around. Scott, what's the most important thing you ever learned? I haven't learned anything. I'm perfect. <laughs> <laughs> what's um, the, what would you tell other perfect. people they need to be better at? Oh, everything. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, uh, actually, the, the most important thing, and I'm, I'm going to steal it from Slim Pickens, who said this on the set of. Uh, Doctor Strange Love, or How I Learned to Love the Bomb. Uh, he was interviewed by a magazine and newspaper. Do you have any advice to young people coming up in movies? And he says, oh yes, yes I do. Very piece of important advice. Sit when you can. <laughs> <laughs> and it's true. Bring no, a chair. <laughs> bring a motherfucking chair. <laughs> because or something to lean on. You will be standing around. We did Dorkness. Mm-hmm. The yep. gargoyle time felling scene. I won't we'll talk about the other part of that, but we thought, oh, we're just moving from this side of the game store to this side of the game store, literally 10 feet. Six hours later, the lights were set up. <laughs> <laughs> Granted, we started drinking 30 minutes when we thought they'd be ready in 30 minutes, and well, yeah, it took 16 takes and we never got it right. But anyway, uh, you know, you learn those things on a, your first movie. Do we set. want to say don't drink on set as well then? No, 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 we don't really want to say that. Sometimes it's necessary. Yeah. You work with um, other people. <laughs> you need to. <clears throat> Christian, what did you learn? What's your thing? Uh, I learned the most important thing I learned on a movie set. Um, no, no, no. What's the most important thing you would tell another person who wants to be a filmmaker? Yeah. Oh! <coughs> oh, absolutely. God, great advice. Um, do something else. No. <laughs> <laughs> That's usually pretty close to the top of everyone's list. <laughs> Are you sure? Just lo yeah, just love what you do. Like, if you're working on a project, if it's not something that, if it's not a project that you love and you're not getting paid for, do something different. Because everybody who contributes to a project like that um, is behind it 100%. And if you're not going to be the person who's there 100% for it, then uh, do something different. You know, you're contributing 100% of the time on a movie set. So even if you, know, even if you don't know it, just the personality or your, your persona or how you're feeling that day. Don't be the weak link. Yeah, if you're, if you're grumpy and you don't really want to be there, it's going to come across and it's going to bring the whole set down. It's really a but I, I will go back though to Christian's statement, the first one, which was a joke, but I don't think it is. Do no. something else. Yeah. If you are compelled to do this, you'll come back to it. I Whether started, they pay you or not. <laughs> I started in 89, and I took time off, and I've had a full-time job. That's before most of you were born. <laughs> <laughs> hard and it was a struggle and I booked more films last year when I was working full time than I did this year when I have an agent so it's a little weird but um, you know go do something else and if you're drawn to come back here then give it everything who are you? Uh, uh, find people you want to work with find that group of people that's the most important thing for me is, is um, I would be able to do what I do and tell me it isn't Sometimes try to say that it is, <laughs> but what I do on my own and all that kind of stuff, it's never about that. It's it's about a group of people making something, and if you don't have the right people that are in that group, then you're not going to get anything done. And uh, you, you 
you got to work with people that you enjoy working with and you want to come back and work with. Otherwise, there's no point to it. So. I would follow up with that and just say also leave your ego at the door and, and leave her, you know, understand this is a, a collaborative art form since cinema is this amalgam of um, all these great ideas coming together. So there isn't, there isn't one real answer. And, and be open for feedback. Let other people take charge of different assets and, and act as a project. And, uh, and that's really what's going to make the project better. I mean, if they're, like Adam said, it's not a one man show or one woman show. It's, it's about everybody contributing. That's what makes the project unique and what it is. Um, I am being a little harsher. You are not a unique, beautiful snowflake. <laughs> you are not a genius. You are not perfect. Um, and you cannot do this by yourself. Who would try? You would be shocked. <laughs> uh, and I don't mean that, uh, and I don't mean by yourself as in like I set up the lights, and I mean by yourself as in you're the only opinion that really matters. Um, One day. Jay, uh, uh, Tyler, who did Glitch, is amazingly talented, and he is, and he knows it. He is really, really arrogant, um, but he is smart enough to say, and I've seen him do it, the smartest idea in the room wins. And if the cameraman has a suggestion that is better than what he had in mind, he is smart enough to put himself aside and say, no, we're going to do that instead. Um, and that's why film is supposed to be collaborative, and that's why when it's not, it's never as good as it could be. And Christian just creeped out everybody. <laughs> <laughs>